and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to talk to the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. You are a big part of the show. Join our conversation tonight. Any question that you have, our experts will answer. 877-731-6733. Three, three. And joining us live tonight from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center and world-renowned doctor. We also have Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City Vice President and Omaha Branch Executive, Nate Kaufman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here with us tonight. We know how busy you are. Dr. Gold, let's start with an overview of how widespread COVID-19 is in rural America tonight. Well, Christina, the numbers uh, continue to grow across the United States, as I'm sure uh, most of our audience knows. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that we exceeded 5 million confirmed cases of COVID uh, across the country and just over 160,000 confirmed deaths uh, due to the virus. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we continue to see spread, not just uh, in the southern states and across the western corridor, but in rural communities as well. Indeed, when you look at the map of uh, not only the number of confirmed cases, but the rate of growth, the rate of transmission of the virus, we continue to see growth in the small and the uh, rural communities. Now, this chart tells a very important message, and that is we saw a peak uh, in late April, early May in the United States of new cases per day, and then we started to have a slow decline until the end of June, the beginning of July, when things started to really go up as we opened up uh, many of our small uh, and our large cities uh, across the United States. This tended to peak towards the middle uh, and latter weeks uh, of July. And then over the last several weeks, uh, you can see that there's actually been a beginning of a fall off in the number of cases per day. So while there are days we exceeded 70,000, that's 70,000 uh, new cases per day, uh, we really are now between 40 and 50,000 new cases per day. This chart gives us a look at the number of deaths per day in the United States. And again, the same general phenomenon, a pretty early peak in late April and in May, a pretty brisk fall off. And then starting in the beginning of July, roughly after the 4th of July weekend, we started to see an increase and we're now very much uh, in a plateau stage. So we have learned more about how to care for patients with COVID. We've learned how to keep them out of the hospital, how to keep them off ventilators. We've learned which medications are effective and hopefully we'll get a chance to unpack that later tonight. Absolutely. We have so much to cover. I can't wait to talk about the latest developments on the vaccine front, but you brought us another wonderful guest, Dr. Gold. Nate, as the vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, part of your job is finding a remedy now for a sick economy. Talk about the role that the Fed has played in the pandemic so far. Well, let me thank you but for inviting me to the program. It's a, it's a, it's great to be here. I've enjoyed the opportunity to interact with Dr. Gold on this topic. I've learned a lot from, from Dr. Gold as it relates to the progression of the pandemic. And when I go back to the environment of March and April surrounding the pandemic, um, you know, those charts that Dr. Gold showed were very, were quite familiar. And at that time, conditions were evolving quite rapidly. There was a need for the Fed to step in as it assesses what we often refer to as its dual mandate to maximize employment, but yet maintain stable prices, there was a need to step in with aggressive policy action, I think, in an attempt to help smooth some of that transition, some of the financial market disturbances at the time. So we find ourselves still in an environment where there is still a very uncertain outlook for the economy and to a significant extent requires us understanding those kinds of uh, information related to the, to the healthcare environment that Dr. Gold presented. Absolutely. And now we're getting to the point for a lot of Americans where they are going to come to a point where it's hard to pay their bills. We know that this has already been troublesome for a lot of rural Americans. And so we're excited to have you on the show tonight to talk about some of the solutions when it comes to the economic side of the equation. And of course, we have Dr. Gold to address your medical question. So let's get right to it. Ernie from Iowa writes, I haul grain from Iowa to Louisiana. And I'm wondering why so many people are driving by themselves with a mask on. 
I even saw a guy on a motorcycle with an N95. Why? You know, Ernie, I think a lot depends on the circumstances. <clears throat> so if you're driving in a car or in a truck, <clears throat> excuse me, where you're the only person that sits behind the wheel, uh, you don't ha have passengers that you're uh, traveling with uh, frequently, then you don't need to wear a mask. And, and that's not a really good use of your mask. Uh, and you should save it uh, for other occasions. However, Ernie, if, uh, if you're not the only one that drives your car or truck, uh, if you frequently have passengers, uh, not just your immediate family, but people that you may not know all that well, particularly if it's a work vehicle, then I think driving with a mask is a really good idea. As far as being on a motorcycle with an N95, I don't quite get that, but, uh, you know, maybe there are things that I just don't understand yet. <laughs> We appreciate that question. Thank you so much for that. Bruce of Pennsylvania is next. He says, the ag industry was in a downturn before COVID-19. Now the future looks even more dim as the global economy contracts. Do you think we'll ever see restaurants packed again? You know, maybe both of us can take a shot at that, Christina. Uh, I actually do think that we're going to see the restoration of the restaurant business uh, over a period of time. It's not going to happen overnight. But I think that restaurants can successfully uh, reduce the density of their customers. And they may not be packed in the sense of, of what we're used to looking at with a whole bunch of people sitting at the bar, you know, on a cold, on a, having a cold one on a, on a hot summer night, uh, or large gatherings in some of the private rooms, at least not for a time until we have an effective and a safe vaccine available to us. But I do think at least the restaurants that I frequent uh, and know about here in our community have learned how to de-densify. Their staff have learned how to be extremely respectful. They all use personal protective equipment and face coverings, and they give the customers a sense of security. So uh, I do think we're going to be seeing that. I don't know, Nate, do you have, you have thoughts on uh, on their food service business, because I think that's really what we're talking about here. Well, I think it starts with a recognition that that industry is an important driver for prospects in the ag and, and rural economy. It starts with demand for food and leads into demand for agricultural commodities. During the months of March and April, we saw tremendous disruptions to supply chains and getting some of those products from farms eventually to the stores where people were able to go and purchase them. And so as those conditions evolve, we're monitoring very carefully to see how consumers, are they going back to restaurants? Are they going to continue going to supermarkets and, and places like that that would require a different kind of uh, logistical system to be able to deliver product? Because that is important in terms of the, the pricing for products on the farms. You know, our farmers have been working so hard amidst those disruptions you were just talking about. They are essential employees. They've been going to work every single day, but they too have been impacted financially as well as medically. Nate, from a Fed perspective, talk about how the pandemic is affecting the pocketbooks of American farmers and ranchers and the rural communities that they support. Yeah, I think that's also a great question. And it starts, I think, with the recognition that there were some challenging times even coming into 2020. Um, the agricultural economy in this country had been going through really a, a number of consecutive years of challenging financial conditions with low profits and relatively subdued um, commodity prices. As we started to see COVID-19 and the pandemic play out, um, you know, there were a couple of key elements that I think have contributed to even lower prices and some more uncertain times ahead and challenges there. So I do think that it's an environment that's been difficult for farmers. It's been difficult for rural communities in addition to a lot of other folks. Um, and so part of our job at the Fed is really to do the best that we can to understand what those challenges are and then be able to describe those for policy consideration. Yeah, you know, Nate, do you think that the, uh, that the supply chain has been restored? Uh, you know, we talked a lot about that earlier this year, particularly when we saw uh, outbreaks of COVID in the meatpacking industry and, uh, and we saw either partial closure or even complete closure of some of those facilities. Uh, do you think that's pretty well back, uh, you know, either in our region or nationally? There was a time, I would say, Dr. Gold, during the months of April and early May, for example, where our beef and processing um, facilities were operating at about 60 percent, meaning that there had been a lot of production that had come offline due to COVID disruptions, due to some of the other supply chain disruptions that we've been talking about. Most of that production has come back online, but there still are some challenges just in terms of 
you know, maintaining the safety of those plants and, and recognizing that there have been changes in the way consumers are now buying their products. So there are still are things that are, are, are quite different, but also not as um, quite as extreme as what conditions would have been back in April. And it's hard to tell which routines that consumers are changing to are going to stick after all this. So it has to be difficult as you're making your economic forecast going forward. Dr. Gold, you know how hard this has been. You've seen the community around you. Everybody has gone through challenging times during this pandemic, uncertain financial times as well. And all of this can certainly add to the stress that everybody already was experiencing across the country. What advice do you have for our viewers who might need some help handling all that stress? You couple that with a political season and, and it's a challenging time out there. Sure. So uh, we like to talk about the multiple pandemics. And, you know, most of us, uh, at least in the medical field, when we talk about the pandemic, we're talking about COVID-19. We're talking about the virus itself. But there are other major medical and emotional changes that have been occurring. And one of them, Christina, you call out very clearly, which is the stress and the burnout and even the depression and tragically from time to time, the suicide associated with social isolation, associated with the economic downturns, associated with uh, the inability to interact with each other, to go to church, to go to school, uh, to even participate in, in routine community activities, to be with family and friends and, and loved ones uh, over what has now become, uh, you know, well more than four months. We've been doing this, and, uh, and all of us had thought that, you know, if we can get through, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, we can put this behind us and get back to the new normal. At least uh, I was certainly hoping for the new normal, and, uh, and I don't frankly see that at least uh, not for the next couple of months until we can get a vaccine in our hands that's both safe uh, and effective. However, in direct answer to your question as to what's the advice, the advice is that we're not alone and that even if we're socially distanced uh, or living alone uh, for a period of time, you know, pick up the phone, uh, use the technology, FaceTime, Skype, uh, even our Zoom meetings, which, you know, all of us like to say we're Zoomed to death, you know, whatever that means. Uh, and that just means to me that we're spending a lot of time in the, in the Zoom environment. But it, it, it's a lot better than being alone. And, uh, and for those of us that are really stressed out, and there are the warning signs of loss of appetite, loss of interest in other things, trouble falling asleep, uh, those sorts of signs and symptoms, that's when it's time to call your healthcare professional or one of the 800 numbers and explain that to whoever's on the other end of the phone and make sure that they have an opportunity to reach out and extend a hand to you because none of us are ever alone in this and, uh, and we just can't lose track of that. And we're here for you every Monday at 5 p.m. Central Time. So you can call us, 877-731-6733. We would love to hear from you. Our next question is from Tim of Oklahoma. He writes, what's the difference in how coronavirus spreads indoors versus outdoors? We work almost entirely outdoors on our ranch, and we don't want a false sense of confidence. Sure. So... The recent research, and a lot of that research was actually done here uh, at the Med Center uh, in Nebraska, has shown that the virus particles do linger in the air, particularly when they're in high concentration. And this is research that was done uh, not in a classroom or in a church or in a place of work, but actually in hospital rooms in which patients being treated for COVID uh, were being monitored. And so air samples were taken and they were studied not just for fragments of virus, but for actually live virus that has been recovered. And the reason being is that, as we all know, that when we're outdoors, even if it's not a particularly windy day, there's a good amount of air exchange that occurs. However, when we're indoors, if there's not a lot of ventilation, if the windows can't be opened, if the HVAC system is not exchanging the air several times an hour, the air will stagnate. And what we see is that these virus particles will linger in the air, which is why that when people are outdoors, if they're going for a walk or a jog or they're with somebody uh, of their family outside, they do take off their mask from time to time and they do enjoy the outdoors, particularly now during the warmer weather. That's actually one of our concerns 
is that the weather starts to get colder, people are going to go back indoors, uh, they're going to be in these contained environments, they're going to be with more people in a closed space, meaning physically closer together, and all that's going to do is set the stage for uh, transmission of the virus. And so my answer is, uh, you know, if you can be outdoors, uh, uh, all, all the power to you and try to spend as much time as possible. All right. We're going to go to the phones. Sheila from Arizona has a question for you tonight. Thanks for joining us, Sheila. Go right ahead. You're welcome. Um, I just have a comment about the uh, wearing a mask in the car by yourself. I live about 20 miles from town, <clears throat> and I um, don't put the mask on until I get to town. But when I do get there, I leave it on because I feel that, you know, the more you futz around with it, uh, the, the more likely you are to cause yourself problems. Um, and the, uh, on the way out, I wait till after I've driven a couple miles before I take it off. Uh, the motorcycle guy, I, I guess he just wants to keep bugs out of his teeth. I don't, I don't know. But that, that's my feeling about <clears throat> driving with a mask on. Yeah, I think, Shelly, you're right on. Uh, the, uh, the less you manipulate the mask, uh, the better off you are. Because uh, what will happen over a period of time uh, and we've seen this, that if you're exposed to somebody, particularly close up, who coughs or sneezes or is shedding live virus of any type, not just uh, COVID-19, the masks will trap those micro droplets uh, in the cloth or in the paper coverings of the mask. And so the more that you manipulate the mask with your hands, the higher the chances you will then touch your face uh, and before you know it, uh, you may get exposed to the virus. So I think your ideas are are right on, particularly on that drive home. You know, we know that the virus does not live long in, in dry heat, does not live long on surfaces. It lives much longer on the skin and on your eye surfaces, uh, you know, on your mouth and uh, nose, uh, et cetera. And so uh, if you can let that mask dry out real well, uh, you have a higher chance of, uh, of not contaminating yourself. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Sheila. And that leaves a line open for you. Remember, our phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. When we come back, we are going to talk about the latest in therapies. We're going to talk about the latest in vaccine development and possibly get a timeline from Dr. Gold. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor and world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold. Also joining us tonight, Vice President and Omaha Branch Executive at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, Nate Kaufman, joins us. And we're going to get into vaccines, but Nate, it is a very rare occasion that we have somebody from the Federal Reserve on the show with us. So I do want to ask a burning question that many of us are wondering about. How is the GDP plunging, yet the Dow is staying in record territory right now? I, I think that's a, that's a great question, and it's among the things that we try very hard as, as, as best we can to understand through data and through talking to businesses and interacting with firms and organizations. Um, you know, there's a number of possibilities, I think, for that. I think one could be that markets do tend to have uh, the tendency to look much further on. And so they may be seeing the potential for, as Dr. Gold has talked about, you know, later on a, a vaccine or looking past 2020 and seeing that prospects in 2021 may look better, or maybe recognizing that the U.S. economy was positioned really pretty well coming into 2020 and that once this pandemic passes, there would be strength there again. So um, some firms do appear to be doing better than others, and I think that's certainly clear. Um, but those are, those are developments that we would monitor on a regular basis at the Fed. Well, you know, it's it's nice for those of us who have a 401k not to see that all that money just vanishing amidst this pandemic. So that's very interesting. I did want to ask you about that. All right, let's move on to our viewer questions. Davis Family of Wisconsin writes, greetings from Waukesha. We're wondering if the coronavirus vaccine will keep you from getting the virus or just lessen the actual symptoms. So Davis family, we get asked that question all the time. And the answer to the question is, but probably it's going to do both. Uh, first of all, there are going to be multiple different vaccines uh, that are going to be available, and they're going to be somewhat different. You know, last time I checked, 
There were something like 165 to 170 vaccines under production worldwide. There were about 135 to 140 uh, that were still in the laboratory, uh, either being developed or being tested in laboratory animals. And then there were about 35, 36, maybe even 40 uh, that were in various stages of clinical testing. And there are three stages of clinical testing, uh, stage one and stage two, or phase one and phase two, as it's more currently known. Uh, those are safety tests. Phase one would be tests in uh, basically young, healthy people uh, to see if they have any side effects from the vaccine. Uh, phase two testing is also safety testing, but it's being done in older or people with multiple disabilities to look for safety. And then phase three is when you really get to efficacy testing. That's when you start to find out whether the vaccine is really going to prevent uh, the spread of the virus or whether it's going to weaken the impact of the virus. So, you know, think about flu vaccine, Christina. We, uh, you know, we all or most of us hopefully get flu vaccine, uh, you know, in the fall. And by the way, this would be a really good year to get your flu shot. Uh, for some people, it keeps you from getting the flu. Depends how strong your immune system is, et cetera. For other people, uh, you may get it, but you get a much milder case of it. And people think, you know, our, the people, meaning our scientists, that is, of course, uh, think that that's what's going to happen with the COVID vaccine. The minimum standard for uh, FDA approval or uh, what's called an EUA or an emergency use authorization is going to be 50% effective. So whether that's 50% fewer cases, or 50% milder cases, we're also thinking that it's going to take more than one injection, that you're going to get an injection and then probably two weeks, three weeks, maybe four weeks later, uh, come back for a booster. And what that's going to do is, is tee up your immune system to be even more selective and better armed and stronger uh, to prevent the transmission uh, of the virus. Different vaccines for different people. There'll be some vaccines for older and more vulnerable people. There'll probably be some vaccines for our youth, children, uh, et cetera, and then some for those of us in the middle. Okay. Do you think that these vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines, will be mandated by public schools, just like we see some of the others, like rubella, for example? <laughs> You know, I think at some point we might get to that stage. I think until we have a larger community experience, both on the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine, I think we're probably not going to get into a mandated role. Now, we may see some sub-examples of that. So, for instance, you may see some professional athletic programs, or you may see some, uh, you know, theater groups or, or others uh, that have as a company policy that at least they offer the vaccine. Uh, we may see it actually in the healthcare delivery system. You know, uh, we mandate uh, flu vaccine uh, every year for all of our employees. Now, there are some who cannot be vaccinated because they have allergies. And of course, uh, we grant exemptions for anybody that has a medical reason that they need an exemption. But at the end of the day, we've decided, and I'm talking about the medical profession writ large, uh, that if you're going to provide care, particularly to more vulnerable people, people with other disease problems, you know, think cancer, heart disease, uh, et cetera, that you probably shouldn't be spreading the flu and you should do everything you can uh, to do that. And so uh, we do strongly, strongly recommend and in many institutions <coughs> actually uh, mandate a uh, flu vaccine. Okay, thank you for that. We are going to go back to the phones. Eileen of Minnesota is up next. Thanks for joining us, Eileen. Go right ahead. Hi. Um, I think that I actually had uh, COVID uh, in February. And um, about four times during the time that I had it, I felt like, and of course, I just thought I was sick. <laughs> and so about four times, um, I would just have to open up the doors in the house, and then I would stand in the doorway, and I would breathe in fresh air, you know, oxygen. But, and I'm wondering whether the cold air, because it wouldn't take very long. And then I'd go down, and I'd be fine. And, of course, I thought, well, how can that help? Because during the summer, but if you put ice in a glass and put water in the bottom, you can actually breathe cold air. And I'm just wondering... If, if that is true, that it actually helped me. And then I have some other comments, too. But 
Hello. <laughs> you know, hard to know, Eileen. Generally speaking, uh, when people get congested, uh, whether it's from the flu or from COVID or from uh, any one of these uh, upper respiratory infections, usually it's warm, humid air that makes you feel better. You know, you think about when uh, our kids were little and they had croup, uh, you'd take them into a bathroom and let the shower water run and uh, or run a vaporizer and uh, give them some of that warm, humid air to uh, break up some of the congestion uh, in their uh, nasopharynx and, uh, and in their chest. Uh, that is probably true uh, for most people with COVID. I know that when you put somebody on a ventilator, one of the things that you do is you warm the air and you humidify the air so that they tend to have uh, as fluid secretions as possible so that they can cough and they can clear uh, their secretions uh, easily. Uh, you know, one of the other things, Eileen, that I think would be worthwhile for you is uh, when your community starts to have antibody tests available, uh, even though it was back in February that you think you were ill, it might not be a bad idea for you to get tested and see if you've got antibodies because the antibody tests that are coming out now are much more sensitive and much more specific. And if you had antibodies, if you have antibodies to COVID, you'd probably want to know that. It doesn't quite render you immune, but it certainly would be uh, good news in terms of things like travel, uh, being with other people, attending social events, uh, uh, other things that you, know, you and I uh, cherish so much about our lives. Thank you so much for that call, Eileen. We appreciate it. You know, Dr. Gold, we have been meeting for a few months now since this pandemic started, trying to bring the latest information to the viewers across rural America. And there have been a lot of moments that now we can look back on and wonder if we did everything right. I know you did, Dr. Gold, but wearing a mask now become part of our routine. There was a shortage at first when we first learned of the virus. Do you think there would be a big difference in the magnitude of the spread if masks were our first line of defense when we first learned about the virus? You know, Christina, I, I actually do. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there's uh, no right, wrong, or indifferent about it. But I think the science now conclusively shows that wearing a mask <clears throat> protects other people and it protects the person who wears the mask. I do not go out into the public uh, without wearing a mask. First of all, I think I need to set an example for other people as the chancellor of the university. But more importantly, uh, I'm making a statement that I care about other people, you know, and I, I don't know whether the person who's, you know, six feet away from me, 10 feet away from me in the grocery store or uh, in the pharmacy, or even when I'm just taking a walk in the park and, uh, you know, I do everything I can to maintain physical distancing, but I don't know whether they live with somebody who's older, somebody that's fighting cancer or heart disease or has asthma, whether or not they have a child that's, you know, uh, born with some uh, anomaly or uh, has been treated uh, with a bone marrow transplant. Uh, you know, it's, we, it's about being respectful to other people and to taking personal responsibility. So, you know, there, if you read the statistics, and there have been a number of papers published recently, there's some speculation that, uh, that if we don't start collectively wearing masks, monitoring social distancing and doing it widely across the United States. Uh, by the time the Christmas holidays come, we could be looking at 300,000 deaths or more in the United States, maybe even 400,000 by, uh, <clears throat> by New Year's Day. Uh, you think about it, during the entire course of the Second World War, there were just over 400,000 Americans who lost their life during the entire course of that war. And we're talking about less than 10 months here in the United States. I mean, right now, COVID uh, is the number three cause of death after heart disease and cancer uh, in the United States. Wow. The current estimates are that if we all start wearing masks, practicing physical and social distancing, do all the hand sanitizing and washing that we've talked about, that we could cut those numbers down by 60, 80, even possibly 100,000 between now and the Christmas holidays. You know, that's 100,000 parents and grandparents. That's 100,000 brothers and sisters of people that we know and love and people that we've never met and will never meet 
that we have an opportunity to do something positive to help. It's such a small thing to do. Uh, it just makes perfect sense to do it. That's 100,000 of God's children is the way that I like to think about that. Our next question comes from rural California. Colleen has a question that you both, both might want to weigh in on. Let's listen. I was just wondering, looking ahead to the future from what we now know from COVID-19, do you think that we will see a national stockpile of supplies that would be readily available? I really appreciate your time. Thank you. You know, Colleen, for a, a very long time, uh, we have had a national stockpile of things like masks and drugs, some ventilators, uh, and a number of other things that have been deployed by the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and maintained uh, for not just pandemics, but for oil spills, chemical spills, hurricanes, thing, things along those lines, what I would call a combination of natural and, uh, and man-made uh, disasters. But in truth, uh, you know, when you're talking about five million Americans, when you're talking about the millions and millions of tests uh, that have to be done, when you're talking about the number of hospitalizations, uh, the amount of antiviral therapy uh, that's necessary, we're living in a time uh, that's, you know, basically been unprecedented since, uh, since 1918. And sure, you know, a little bit more warning, uh, we could have possibly stockpiled some personal protective equipment, done a better job of manufacturing testing supplies, and we're still struggling because, as you may know, some communities across the U.S. are now waiting five, seven, even ten days for a test result. I mean, it's almost a wasted test if it's going to take that long to turn it around because people need to know almost immediately whether they need to be quarantined and whether their contacts need to be traced and isolated or not. So the answer to the question is, uh, I hope we can do a better job on supply chain management, but I also hope that we never get into this situation again and we can do a better job of being uh, forward-leaning and, and being able uh, to do the necessary containment that would be uh, uh, able to keep us out of this kind of trouble. Nate, do you have thoughts on the supply chain? Well, I think what I would add to that, too, and you noted this, that this has been an unprecedented time in terms of what's happened, and I would add to that it's been unprecedented in terms of the economy at the same time. And I've had the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Gold sort of what that looks like as a balance between some of what we've seen on the healthcare side and the pandemic, but also recognizing what this has translated to in terms of economic needs and challenges. So th this really has been an unprecedented time where there's an extreme um, economic uh, hardship that a lot of people are facing, and, and that's in, true in rural areas as well. Um, so I think that will be one of the important um, perspectives to keep in mind as there are opportunities to, to take into account the kinds of things that Dr. Gold highlighted. You know, uh, Christina and, and Colleen, there's another aspect to that that I think is worth mentioning, and that is that we have become an incredibly global economy and that we depend on supply chains from all over the world. And I'm not just talking about masks and gowns and caps, and, but I'm talking about medications, little bottles the medications come in, syringes. I mean, it, to some extent, uh, they come from all over the world, but a lot of them come from China, they come from India, they come from, you know, we're just a very, very global economy. And, uh, and when things start to become in shortage, like they are right now, uh, people start to hoard them. Uh, you know, you think about what's happened with toilet tissue, for instance, uh, and, uh, and, you know, whoever thought people would be hoarding uh, uh, toilet tissue. Uh, you know, as I, I saw a cartoon not too long ago, that if you need to hoard 144 rolls of toilet paper, you've got a different problem on your hands. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, it just makes the case that our supply chains are global and we need to be aware of that. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to go to a great Midwestern state to talk to Don from Iowa. Thanks for joining us, Don. Go right ahead. Yes, I'd like to ask if um, centers like Mayo Clinic are treating acute patients with convalescent plasma antibodies. I think they're getting these antibodies by cloning. Could they be obtained by uh, laboratory uh, synthesis. 
if it could be synthesized, it seems to me they could be created on a large scale in a laboratory type factory. What do you think? I think, Don, you're right on. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, one, we're seeing the use of convalescent serum, which is uh, serum derived from individuals who have had COVID, who have high antibody levels uh, to COVID. We're seeing the purification of that serum uh, in, the, in laboratories and then being used as a medication. And we're actually also uh, seeing uh, other means of chemically manufacturing uh, antibodies. Now, it's not quite as much. Uh, there are also some large animal models, you know, uh, given the fact we're talking to a lot of farmers and ranchers uh, in the United States, there it's actually possible for cattle to manufacture antibodies, human antibodies, uh, which are specific to uh, diseases such as Ebola or MERS or SARS uh, or COVID uh, in this case, and then to uh, test that. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, as effective as that may be, it's the vaccine that we're really looking for because all of these therapies are a variable effect. Thank you so much for that call, Don. We are going to go international, gentlemen. We're going to Manitoba, Canada for our next call. Clarence joins us. Thanks for joining us, Clarence. Go right ahead. Hello. I have a question to the doctor about the... Uh, I bought myself a, like a, a face mask. It's plastic shield. And uh, would that work? It's, it's easier to breathe through it. And uh, it, like, it's a shield from plastic. And uh, I was just wondering if that would be good. I can see my name on the... On the, on the TV? On the, <laughs> You know what he's talking yeah, about, Clarence. right, Dr. Gold? The, the, the clear plastic? I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so the current recommendations are for uh, facial and nasal masking. You know, you want to, you know, I'm not, never more than an arm length away from my mask. Covers my mouth, covers my nose, uh, and stops the spread of droplets and traps droplets that are being uh, aimed uh, at me. We know now, though, because the virus can be recovered from the air, that means that the lining of your eyes, which is called your conjunctiva, uh, can also be the site of infection. And so we have been using, uh, and this is the healthcare profession for some period of time now, uh, these shields uh, that stop uh, the spread against your eyes. They are not as effective uh, as a mask, uh, though. And so what the healthcare professionals do uh, is they do both. They wear their facial masks that cover their mouth and they cover their nose. Uh, and then they wear either goggles or they wear a shield. And so it's not an either or, it would have to be a both. So Clarence, I would say to you that although uh, I, the, the shield is better than nothing, it's not as good as a mask, and a mask and a shield is better than either alone. Maybe that would be the best way to think about it. All right. Thank you so much for that question. We're getting some really great questions tonight. We're going to pause for a quick break, but we still have room for your call. Our lines are open. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to have more Rural Health Matters coming your way, and we're going to ask Nate about what his prediction is for when the economy will go back to pre-virus form. I know it's a tough question, but I'm sure he'll have a good answer for us on the other side of this break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor and world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And we also have Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City Vice President and Omaha Branch Executive Nate Kaufman joining us. Nate, let's talk about this economic downturn. How does it compare with other periods of economic distress for the country? And then let's break it down a little bit more granularly and take a look at agriculture if we can. Well, I think that it's it's important to recognize just the severity of the downturn that we've observed, and we've been talking a little bit about this that Dr. Gold alluded to, even as it relates to some of the unprecedented aspects of the pandemic. 
And we've seen, for example, in the second quarter of this year, about a 33% hit to GDP. And that's, that's one of the largest decreases that we've seen going back to the 1940s. Um, certainly some industries have been affected much more severely than others, and those tend to be the industries where um, people are, are needing to gather and businesses that depend on people gathering for, for them to, to see their, their profits. So I think that the recovery, though, very much will depend on the, the pandemic and how the, the pandemic and the virus progresses. Um, we've been, of course, following how the number of cases and, and other aspects pertaining to the pandem pandemic have been playing out over the course of the past several months. And some industries are still seeing some significant challenges versus other industries, specifically those in technology that have done actually rather well as a lot of households and businesses have looked to try to leverage the use of technology to try to get business done. So those are some things that I think will be important um, and that we'll be monitoring in the, in the months ahead. All right. Our next question is from Rick of Ohio. He writes, our small town has been hit by the opioid epidemic and I've seen lives ruined. With a poor economy and people forced into isolation, how much of a cost do you think addiction will take on the country after the pandemic? Uh, you know, Rick, uh, tragically, there is no question that when people get stressed, when people get depressed, when people get burnt out, uh, that that's one of the things that people turn to is uh, opioids, alcohol, other substances uh, as well, which is why that we are so strongly, strongly recommending that people stay connected. But we already have a very significant opioid problem uh, in the United States. We have more opioid-related deaths than motor vehicle accident deaths uh, in our country and have had for uh, many years. And, uh, and the pandemic uh, is probably only going to exacerbate that. Now, that's just my opinion. We really haven't seen uh, that reported, at least to the best of my knowledge, uh, in the scientific literature yet. But, you know, I think it's early on, and we're just going to start to see uh, more and more of that. You know, the, the other side of the coin, of course, is that with uh, uh, students that are not back at school uh, in the K-12 system, uh, those that are not back in uh, higher ed, uh, social events, you know, really markedly down, we may see, for at least for some time period, less impact of opioids and alcohol and more homebound type of activities. But you know what uh, our, my psychiatry friends tell me is they think it's just a matter of time. Wow. Okay, we're gonna go back to the phones. Shrem from Arizona is next. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, ma'am. I was watching your program and I listened to that lady who uh, had uh, with, with go out in the cold air was seen to breathe better than in the hot air of the house. And I've, uh, I'm almost 80 years old. I've had uh, um, cancer, I mean, not cancer, asthma, bronchial asthma, uh, most of my life. And when I was, in, I was in construction, and a lot of dust and sawdust, I would get what I could already breathe. And if I took a hot shower, it would almost shut down my breathing. And then if I took a cold shower, I would, it would be okay. And then I had a, when my first son was born, he was kind of born with the same thing. And at two years old, they told him, told us to put a atomizer that he plugged into the wall under his crib, and he would crawl out of the crib and go and unplug the plug because he couldn't breathe. Oh. And so if he unplugged it, then he could actually breathe better. And so I just wanted to tell her that maybe certain types of asthma, maybe you, it does work the opposite way. You know, Shrem, uh, th th there's just no predicting, and that's why, you know, when uh, a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist makes a recommendation to you, uh, you just need to sort of give it a test and uh, see how it goes. You know, what we try to report, what I try to share with you, is just what common medical experience uh, brings. Generally speaking, cold air causes your airways, particularly very cold air, to contract, tends to precipitate asthmatic attacks, tends to make your bronchi uh, shrivel up a little bit and, and make your breathing a little bit harder. I'm sure we've all seen that. For those of us that live in climates that get very cold, uh, you'll notice that the breathing is generally out there. So, you know, there's no question. There's a happy medium. I mean, very hot air, uncomfortable, 
very humid air, uncomfortable, and very cold air, uncomfortable. You know, uh, the best we could do is uh, keep the air roughly at our body temperature, and, and that would be perfect. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's never at 98.6 degrees around us. It's always warm, more or less than that. Thank you so much for that call, Shrem. We love hearing your personal experiences as well, so thank you for that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the trillions of dollars and the long-term impact of all the government spending that we're seeing right now. Nate, I think a lot of us are wondering, where are we going to get the money to pay all that back, and what are some of the long-term repercussions we could be looking at financially? I think that's going to be an, an important question to ask, and, and we should even be having some of those conversations now, obviously, in consideration of what some of the longer-term trends might look like. I think at the same time, though, it is also recognizing the severity of the crisis that we're in right now and, you know, sort of asking the, a similar question of what might have happened had some of those programs not been implemented. So I think the scale of the crisis now has warranted a belief that many of these programs would to the extent that they can help a lot of people out of very difficult environment and businesses that were really struggling um, going, <clears throat> excuse me, going back to March and April. And so I think that those conversations will be increasingly important and I think that we'll want to take into account sort of how things like future inflation might play out or how economic growth might be playing out in the future. But that has to be, I think, next to what we see as the difficulty specifically today that many people are facing. Absolutely. You know, we need to ask the question, uh, Nate, what would have happened if we didn't do that? You know, how much homelessness, how much food insecurity, uh, how much street crime, you know, and, uh, and on and on and on. Could our health care systems have stayed afloat uh, without being bailed out when elective procedures went to zero for, you know, a very long period of time? Could we have not invested in testing and personal protective equipment and, and now vaccine development? Uh, you know, none of these things uh, occur. Uh, without feeding the pump, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. And those are difficult questions to answer about what might have happened had we not em embarked on some of those programs and some of the support. Um, so, you know, I think that we have been encouraged to see that there has been, you know, many households are still finding ways to make payments. And obviously there are still struggles. Um, agriculture is an industry where there have been challenges with low prices, and we've talked some about that. Um, but at the same time, I think that there, that there are people that are looking forward and, and what the, an economic recovery might look like. And had we not embarked on some of those programs, we may be having a different conversation. Yeah, and we'll see what happens from this point out. The good thing is we know that the government cares about the American economy as a whole. It's a bipartisan statement I'm making right there because I've never seen any Federal Reserve do anything like this. Dr. Gold, we're going to get to you in just one moment. We have a caller. Audrey from Minnesota is joining us now. Audrey, go right ahead. Thank you for all the information your program provides us. My question, is there a possibility that a mask can be holding the carbon dioxide inside the mask and be injurious to the mask wearer. Uh, so it's theoretically possible, Audrey, but it's never been shown. And so uh, I would say the risk of not wearing the mask, and for you, family members, friends, etc., particularly when you're in public areas, when you're with people that you may not know, you know, when you pass people in the street or in the shop or wherever you happen to be, uh, you know, public transportation as well, uh, the risk of not wearing a mask far, far, far exceeds uh, the risk of, uh, of wearing it. Now, there are some people uh, who will tell you uh, that the mask is uncomfortable, that it limits their ability to breathe comfortably and easily, particularly people with bad asthma, particularly people who have what we call COPD or chronic obstructive lung disease. But I will tell you, you know, as a practicing surgeon, spent 25 years of my life getting up in the morning, going to the operating room, putting on my cap and my gown and my mask, scrubbing up my hands, putting on my gloves, and spending uh, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16 hours a day in the operating room uh, fixing uh, people's hearts. Uh, I can tell you, you just get used to it, it and, uh, and you don't even think about it. And the reason you do it, of course, is to protect other people. In this case, to protect your patients. In the case of COVID, to protect other people in the community uh, who are at risk 
not only for becoming ill, but from uh, actually getting hospitalized or, heaven forbid, dying from it. You know, there was just a study of looking at a, a hundred thousand uh, kids that were infected uh, just over the last uh, two weeks. And so all of these uh, rumors and uh, about children being immune or being hyper resistant uh, to COVID, there's more than enough examples, tragically, of infection, of hospitalization, and, and even more tragically than that, uh, even death. So uh, wear your mask. That would be my message. All right, we're going to go back to the phones. Toby from Indiana, it looks like you're going to be our last caller. You got in just in the nick of time. Go right ahead, Toby. Uh, thank you. Jim made a comment, and I'm going to make a comment on his. I've always had a runny nose, but the cold, dry air actually clears up my sinuses very good. My question, though, is here in Indianapolis, it's customary to be 85 or higher temperature with a humidity of 80% or higher. What effect would that have on COVID-19? Yeah, so Toby, uh, quickly, the, uh, the answer is that for a very long time last spring, people thought that when the weather got warmer, when the humidity went up, that we would see a marked decrease in the transmission of COVID. And there is a bit of what we call thermal liability, meaning the virus doesn't like uh, hot temperatures. The virus doesn't like very high humidity. Uh, so uh, that is definitely true. However, uh, on the other side of the equation, we have not seen a big fall off in viral transmission as a result of warmer, more humid uh, air. And so uh, my best advice is independent of the temperature, independent of the humidity, uh, maintain your physical distancing, make sure you wash your hands and surfaces, and please wear your mask. All right, we just have a little bit of time left. I just want to give you each an opportunity, about 30 seconds for final thoughts, Dr. Gold. Well, I think uh, we've already discussed it. Uh, the vaccines are well on the way. There are effective antiviral treatments that keep people healthier and get them out of hospitals faster and safer. But at the end of the day, the way we're going to control this is by taking care of ourselves and others, preventing transmission and spread, and wearing our mask. And Nate, do you have any final thoughts for our viewers when it comes to the economic health of the country right now? Yeah, and I would just elaborate on that just one more step to say that I think what happens going forward with the economy still will very much depend on what happens with this pandemic and how businesses respond and, you know, to Dr. Gold's point, you know, what happens with, with the vaccine going forward. And I think that that will be true both in rural areas and here in, in, in Omaha where we're located and agriculture included as part of that. So we'll be following what those trends look like and hope that uh, the economy takes a turn for the positive uh, relatively soon. I wish she'll be praying for it. Thank you both so much for joining us. We really, we know how busy you are and we're grateful for you spending the time with us. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City Vice President Nate Kaufman. And remember, you can catch Rural Health Matters. We're here for you every Monday night at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 Central. You are an important part of this show. If you had to hang on the line, you didn't get your question tonight, I want to give you a number so you can call and leave us a voice recording, 855-776-6147. And we've got more great programming coming your way. Stick around for Rural America Live. We'll give you a sneak peek inside this year's Farm Progress Virtual Experience Show. Hear from some of the exhibitors and what they have to offer. Tune in to 8 Eastern, 7 Central, right here on RFD TV. Again, we thank you for joining us. We wish you and your family a beautifully blessed night. And of course, we want everyone to stay safe out there. We'll see you back here next Monday for Rural Health Matters.